Alrighty, so all right, thanks everyone for your prayers this week and your encouraging messages. Um, yeah, just to put away any potential rumours, I didn't shave my head to preach like Victor this week. It's, uh, you know, I just needed a haircut, so just put that, just put that away first. I'll start in Romans chapter 10. Okay, the Bible reads from verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, for that um, we're nearing a year, Lord, of this church. Uh, we just pray, Lord Father, that we'll just go out rejoicing because of your word this morning, Lord. Pray, Lord, that we have power, Lord, and that we'll just rejoice in your truths, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning I'm going to be preaching from Romans chapter 10, and it kind of relates to Roman Catholicism, which is what I'm going to be preaching on. And like the Jews in this passage, you know, they went and had their own went and established their own righteousness through the works of the law, like, you know, through the Talmud and through the uh, you know, law, law of circumcision. And uh, just like Roman Catholics who, you know, um, you know, have their own righteousness through, you know, the, the, um, the sacraments. And, uh, you know, and being a Roman Catholic for, you know, 16 years, you know, I've got a lot of pity for Roman Catholics because, you know, it's a, it's a religion that, you know, you can't be sure of having eternal life. You know, we go to, um, you know, we go to the door every week, we speak to many Roman Catholics and, um, you know, they... We, we, we speak to them and they're, they're unsure that they're, you know, going to heaven. And I just want to, um, just want to start, for, I just want to start by saying, um, it's very similar to Islam, as in, um, you know, Islam say that they've got five pillars to, you know, go to heaven. And so too for Catholics who say that they need to do the five sacraments. You know, there's really seven sacraments, but, you know, marriage and um, the uh, last rites being one of them. But, um, you know, obviously not every Catholic gets married or not every, you know, person gets to have the last rites before they die because, you know, some, some people die, you know, um, you know, unexpectedly, you know, through car crashes or, or for whatever else. Uh, so it's really just the five in, as in baptism, Holy Communion, reconciliation and confirmation. All right, I'll just go to John chapter 3. Okay. I'll just start from verse number one. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. So pretty much what Jesus is saying, he's uh, talking about that how, how our first birth was corrupt, and uh, how that we need to be born again the second time. How that you know that you know through our first birth, you know, the, um, death from Adam passed on to us, and that we need to have a spiritual birth, uh, so that it could, it could be perfected. But what the Catholics believe is that they believe in verse number five, that when Jesus says that um, except a man be born of water, they say that you have to be born of water baptism. And so I just, um, but what Jesus is really saying, you know, Jesus wasn't pointing to baptism, but rather he was using an analogy of being born again. So we've all been born of water, a physical birth and have to be born again of the Spirit, which is a spiritual birth. And, um, <clears throat> and I'll just go to... This is what Victor sent me, so I don't take any credit for it. It's from Job 38. Okay, so it says, verse 8, it says, Or who shut up the sea with the doors when it break forth, as it had issued out of the womb. So God is likening the breaking of the sea unto water that comes out of the womb. 
you know, this strengthens Jesus' illustration of being born again. So once again, we've all been born, born of water. When we're, when we're born, that's of flesh. And we have to be born of spirit as well. Okay. This. And, if, and if baptism was necessary to be saved, then, you know, Paul, we all know from that in the Corinthians that Paul was sent not to baptize. It says in our verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So, you know, baptism isn't part of the gospel because works hasn't got anything to do with the gospel of grace. You know, and this is inconsistent, obviously, with the thief on the cross as well. So, you know, obviously, the thief of the cross, you know, um, uh, at, the, at the end, um, he, you know, believed on Jesus Christ and Jesus said, you know, uh, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But he was never baptized. He never had a chance to do, you know, the sacraments that Roman Catholicism believes that we have to do. And also the doctrine of baptizing babies is also biblically wrong. You know, the only biblical defense to why Catholics baptize babies is based on the assumption that, we're infant, that there were infants in Lydia's house when a whole family got baptized in Acts 16, 15. And it's important to compare scripture with scripture. You know, infants can't be baptized because um, they're not capable of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just go to that famous verse from Acts. Okay, from verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, and he baptized him. So clearly that... Um, you know, the Bible gives a condition of being baptized and that's, you know, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, an infant, a baby, isn't, you know, physically or, or mentally or um, able to, you know, uh, believe, in the, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or make that decision. And, um, the, other, and the other belief that the Catholics believe is, um, is that they believe that, you know, that water takes, takes away sin. But the Bible says in Hebrews 9.21, Without the shedding of blood is no remission. And Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You know, Paul didn't say we have, to be, we have redemption uh, in water baptism, but through the blood of Jesus, uh, you know, that cleanses us from all, from all unrighteousness. You know, and like, you know, our, you know, independent Baptist circles, uh, the Catholic Church also believes that, you know, uh, baptism adds a person onto the church. Um, but, you know, uh, early in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, uh, the Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So the moment that we, we get saved, the moment that we um, receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, you know, we're added unto the church. We don't need to you know, get baptized or sign some membership or some, sign some creed. Um, you know, uh, belief is what adds us unto the church. Okay, so. And the, um, the other, so that's baptism covered. The other one is um, you know, Holy Communion. Um, you know, that's where, you know, that's the doctrine where, you know, uh, they believe that the, the, the bread and the wine is the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. And this is where they get it from. I'll just go to John chapter 6. Then Jesus, oh sorry, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at that last day. So Catholics believe, obviously, once again, that they believe that, um, you know, that, the, that the communion, the, the, the bread and the wine is the literal body and blood of Jesus. But in, just down a few verses... In verse 63, um, Jesus says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So 
So Jesus is saying that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, as in spiritual, so they can't be taken literally. And you know, Catholics, you know, they're very much happy to take this, this passage here literally, but you know, there are so many other, you know, uh, passages in the Bible, you know, when Jesus says, you know, um, uh, you know, that he's a door to eternal life, you know, you know, why don't Catholics have a, you know, a literal wooden door to walk into at Mass, you know. Um, and also, you know, other examples include that when Jesus says, you know, I am the vine, you know, it's Jesus, you know, a literal vine, it's obviously, you know, metaphorically. When Jesus says, you know, I am the light of the world, you know, it's, it's Jesus' is a literal torch, like, you know, so obviously, you know, it's, um, you know, Catholics aren't really consistent with it. And, um, and, that, and that's the thing with this, you know, and, and Nicodemus, you know, John chapter 3, you know, he took, he took Jesus literally, said, do I have to enter my mother's womb again, you know? So clearly, you know, um, you know, God wants us to discern, you know, what to take literally and what to take, you know, metaphorically. And, you know, Jesus is just giving a visual of salvation, you know, that it's just as easy as eating a piece of bread and, uh, you, know, you know, easy as walking through, uh, you know, through the door or drinking a glass of water. You know, th and that's why, you know, these Lordship Salvations to say, you know, uh, you believe in like, easy believers, and, you know, that's because it is, because Jesus, Jesus likens it unto these basic activities. You know, it's, it's Jesus who did the hard part by, you know, being nailed onto a tree and dying and rising again for us. And um, I'll just go to Matthew. And Jesus confirms here that, you know, the, um, you know, the wine wasn't his um, literal bride when he said, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he's not saying, he's, 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 you know, you can just imagine the last supper, Jesus is grabbing the wine, he's saying, you know, this is my blood. But he's talking about it metaphorically, but later on he just says, you know, this this is the fruit of my vine, so really he's just referring it to his juice, not as his literal blood. Uh, another thing that they believe in this doctrine is that, you know, they believe that, um, you know, they believe that, you know, Jesus is being sacrificed in the Mass every week, and uh, this is what they believe, um, this, is what the, this is what the Roman Catechism says, uh, during the Mass, no less on Calvary, Christ really does offer his life to the Heavenly Father. Uh, but the Bible says in um, Hebrews 10, 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So Jesus Christ doesn't need to be offered you know, on, a, on a Catholic table every week. You know, he's been offered on, on Calvary, and if we believe on that, you know, we can have eternal life. You know, and... Um, <clears throat> And, and this contradicts, you know, end, end times doctrine, yeah, because, you know, do Catholics really want us to believe that, you know, that Jesus is, you know, transforming himself into bread and wine, you know, down at St. Charbel's Catholic Church down the road? I mean, like, it's, just, it's just like, you know, it's just not reasonable. And that, that covers communion as well. This is from the Roman Catholic Catechism. It says, Priests have power to forgive sins, and confession to a priest at least once a year is necessary for salvation. And this is where they get this, their, um, this is where they point to at scripture. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So pretty much they use this verse to justify that sins can, you know, announce forgiveness or can, can uh, you know, for forgive us of our sins. Uh, but the only time, um, but the difference is that, you know, Priests can't forgive our sins, but, but you know, we as you know, our witnesses of Jesus can pronounce how a person can receive forgiveness. Now I'll just go to the verse in Acts. I've just lost my place. What's that verse in Acts? It says, uh, Whosoever believes in him shall... Uh, now I've lost my place. Acts 10. Yeah. 
So he, so he, um, here the disciples are, you know, um, announcing how you can receive the remission of sins. And it says, to him, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So, you know, it's just like, um, you know, when we, when we uh, declare that, you know, people can know for sure that they're going to heaven and people can have forgiveness of sins at the door, there's, you know, quite a difference, you know. So that's the actual proper context of John chapter 20, verse 23. And next. And here's an example where um, you know, I believe it was Simon of Samaria. He um, he was told to pray to God uh, once he had sinned. Let's just get the verse up. It's verse thirty nine. Actually, no, it's the one. Put down the wrong reference. Do you know the um, Do you know the verse, Simon of Samaria? I oh, say Acts eight twenty two. Sorry. I'll just go up a bit. Okay. When Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles of hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money, sh my mon th thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gifts of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven of thee. So he's, so he's Peter, you know, a, um, you know, an influential figure in you know the early church. You know, saying to Simon, you know, you know pray, to, pray to God. You know, not, not, not to pray to man. So, you know, that's another example that we need to pray to God for the forgiveness of sins. You know, and Paul never, forf Paul never forgave the sins of the jailer. Uh, in Acts sixteen thirty one, he said, "To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved." You know, and remember what the Bible says: "Whosoever believeth in Him shall receive the remissions of sins." And also another thing, it's silly for a third party to announce forgiveness. You know, it would be like me, you know, uh, transgressing against Ashton and me going up to Michael and saying, oh, you know, Michael, I've heard Ashton, you know, do you mind, you know, forgiving me of my sins or do you mind, you know, and Ashton, and, you know, Michael probably say, well, why don't you just go directly to him? You know, it's, it's the same principle. We should be going directly to God for the forgiveness of sins. Not some third party, you know, not some Catholic priest. You know, just go straight to God. And also, you know, you know it's hard to have peace when you confess things to man. You know, I remember, you know, my Catholic days, I used to, you know, uh, you know, go to reconciliation you know, regularly, and you know, I'd find that you know, well, am I really forgiven? I'd have you know, doubts within. Uh, and, and but you know, and you know, and that's just a thought. You know, Judas, you know, who um, you know confessed his betrayal of Jesus before men and then killed himself. You know, he didn't he didn't have you know that peace. You know, he should have went straight to God, gotten saved, and he would have had his um, you know, sins sins cleansed. And the other one is um, the other sacrament is a confirmation. And um, <coughs> you know, this is the the doctrine that you know. You know, it usually takes place when you know, Catholics are in year six, uh, that the priest gives the Holy Spirit. And, uh, but this doctrine is you know, nowhere found in the Bible. You know, the only time you know, there's laying of hands is to set people apart for ministry, you know, according to my, you know, as much as I know. And um, you know, this is what the Catechism says. It says, Confirmation perfects baptismal grace. It is a sacrament which gives the Holy Spirit in order to root us more deeply in the divine filiation, incorporating us more firmly into Christ, which strengthens our bonds with the church. Uh, but the Bible says uh, that you know, God gives us his Holy Spirit. You know, when we ask him in uh, Luke 11, 13, it says, If ye then, being evil, know how, to, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So, you know, I, I believe that's the context as in, you know, when we pray, you know, Jesus, you know, fill us with your Spirit, you know, for boldness, you know, for, for encouragement. And, uh, you know, so... It's not man who gives the Holy Spirit, it's God when we ask him and when we get saved as well. And uh, pretty much, you know, the only, the only um, place in Scripture where I could probably think that, you know, that this confirmation has come from when the Bible says, you know, and, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, I, I do believe that there is a confirming, but quite different to the Catholic one, you know, when, we're, when, we're, when we get saved, you know, the, 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 um, 
the Holy Spirit seals us to the day of redemption, which is, you know, kind of like a confirmation. And, um, yeah, so, and there, are, and there are other, you know, Catholic, Catholic sayings, you know, from, you know, the catechism that, you know, contradicts, you know, having salvation through, um, you know, through the, um, you know, through, through the sacraments. And it says, and this, and this, and this quote here that I got from the catechism which pretty much says that, you know, that Muslims can get saved, surprisingly. It says that the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham and together they which, uh, together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the final day. And you know, once again, you know, these, these Muslims, they've never, you know, been baptized. They've never, you know, taken you know, Catholic communion or, or Catholic confirmation. Or have never gone to a Catholic priest. And, you know, the Roman Catholicism, you know, has pretty much just said, you know, Muslims can get saved as well. And, that, and that's the thing, you know, um, and I believe that, you know, a quote like this is, you know, sort of paving the way for, like, you know, the, you know, the Antichrist, that one world religion, you know. And if you look at the similarities between, you know, um, Islam and, and Catholicism, how they, you know, the robes and, you know, praying to the beads and, and all that stuff, you know, and, and, you know, I just, you know, strongly believe that, you know, that's, that's what's paving that one world religion. And you see these photos of, you know, uh, Pope John Paul II, you know, when he, when he was alive, you know, um, kissing the Quran and, you know, uh, having photos and huddling in prayer with, you know, um, you know these Muslim leaders. So, you know, once again, you know, even, that, even we, uh, the book, the, the, the Roman Catholic Catechism, you know, even that has stuff in it that contradicts all the stuff that they say. You know, it's, you know, it's quite funny because they've always thought that, you know, Protestants are not part of the one true church. They're not, they're not part of the, you know, um, Roman Catholicism. They can't be saved. But, you know, they say that um, Islamic people uh, can be saved. And, uh, you know, even, um, you know, Pope Francis, he's quite, you know, one of the more liberal Roman Catholics, you know, he's come out recently and said, you know, that atheists can go to heaven. You know, not only does that more importantly contradict the Bible, contradict the Bible but, you know, it's just, he's, you know, um, blaspheming, you know, Pope's gone before him and, and, you know, he's contradicted, you know, his whole church. And it's funny because I, I remember when I was, um, you know, I went to my mum's Roman Catholic priest and I went to share the gospel with him in his office. And, uh, you know, I kept uh, stressing, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Acts, I believe it's Acts 4.12, you know, uh, neither is there salvation than the other, for there is none other name given, amongst, given under heaven, given, um, given among men, for whereby we must be saved. And, you know, the priest said, you know, oh, yeah, you know, I agree, I agree with that, but, you know, I still believe a Buddhist or, or a good Muslim or a good atheist can go to heaven. And I just said to him, you know, I said, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say that, that's more important, but, you know, you do realise that if, you know, you, you're, you know, the Catholic high office found out what, you, what you've been saying to me, you'd probably lose your, you know, your ministry, so... You know, it's quite, um, you know, it's quite full on. And, uh, you know, just, j just on an end note, I've, you know, sort of, you know, out of nervousness, just modelled up my notes a bit. So I'll just finish on this. You know, sorry for the short sermon today. But, um, you know, um, just on an end, you know, salvation is through grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not through works, you know. Um, and that's why, you know, this, you know, work salvation religion is, it, it's, you know, it, it makes God out to be, you know, kind of a monster because, you know, we're all, we're all sins, you know. Does God expect us to, you know, to, you know, um, to, to labour and to turn a life when he knows that we're a sinner? You know, what's that psalm that says, you know, he remembers, he remembers our frame that we're made of dust, you know. And I just think that it would be so sad, you know, that, um, you know, God would, um, would get us to do things or to keep the law or to, or to do any of that stuff. You know, it's just, um, you know, it, it contradicts his nature. It just contradicts, you know, uh, everything that's, um, you know, that's written in the scripture. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. This is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, uh, you know, this is, this is one of our favourites, you know, um, Romans 4, 5, you know, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. And, you know, time and time again, you know, Jesus says that, you know, you know, that, um, I understand the Bible says that, you know, it is a gift of God, you know, um, you know salvation is a, is a gift and, you know, that's why I just, um, I was sort of inspired to, you know, talk about Catholicism today because, you know, people are, in, people are in bondage and people, you know, don't know, you know, they're going to heaven and I just think that, um, you know, if we can study up on these false religions and, and uh, just um, equip ourselves to, you know, uh, answer these people according to the hope was with us, we'll see a lot of Catholics get saved and, yeah, at the end of the day, it does come down to a, you know, a, um, a merely sort of thing because, you know, it's like a religion that, you know, you're, you're built with ever since you were born. So, like it's, you know, 
obviously baptism as soon as, you know, months just after you're born and then communion. It's just, it's just this long religion that, you know, uh, ties you to a, you know, a commitment like Islam. You know, we speak to so many Muslims who, who are, you know, who are just tied to tradition and fear of, you know, um, you know, rejecting family or being rejected by family. And, uh, you know, I just think it's important that, you know, uh, that we stress that it's, you know, you know, by faith alone and, you know, that's that. So, yeah, sorry, I'd, the sermon wasn't as long as I'd hoped, but out of nervousness, so hopefully I'll get better. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I, you know, and I was, oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Good job, man. Yeah, people are always nervous when they come up and preach. I'll do some public speaking, but it's not as bad as you think it is. And you know, because when you, pre- when you prepare the sermon, you, you know like all the mistakes you've made. And you know like, I was meant to say this and say it this way and I didn't say it that way. But the people that are listening, they don't know, right? They, they, don't, they don't know, unless you, unless you tell them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's why it's, it's always good. And it's exciting to see, you know, people get up here um, and, and, and try and, and preach. Because obviously, you know, when you're talking to, to individuals, you know, you can be passionate about things. But once you stand up in front of a room, it's... The things that you, you're so familiar with sometimes just go out the door, but it just takes some experience. Um, now, but that was good. I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm an expert on, on Catholicism at all, so I, I definitely learned some things in that sermon. And if you were paying attention as well uh, and, and thinking about what Alex was saying, I think you would have learned some things as well, because I, I think all of us here, even though we know obviously Catholicism is, is wicked and satanic, but then we don't know sometimes the intricacies and the, the arguments that they use to try and support their doctrine. And some of the things I liked in that sermon was just, you know, when, when they take the, the, the broken body and shed blood, literally, the wine and the cup, yeah, and I never really thought that they don't really hold to that consistently, do they? Like when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, and if you shine a light on somebody, you're not saying, I'm shining Jesus on you. <laughs> oh, you know, like, you know, like he said, the, the, the door of their building, they don't say, this is literally Jesus that you need to walk through, um, and things like that. The other, the other thing... Um, I learned in there was, yeah, I guess, you know, when Jesus, when he, when he had the Last Supper, like he referred to the wine as wine, didn't he? Because if he believed that it was literally his blood, why didn't he just say, you know, drink my blood, this is my blood now? He actually referred to it as the fruit of the vine. And the last thing that I, I liked as well is uh, the point where you said that, that Simon, um, he, he actually, uh, Peter actually told Simon when he told him to repent, um, to actually pray to God, you know, whereas if they believe that you had to pray through somebody to receive forgiveness of sin, why was their first pope, you know, telling them to uh, pray directly to God to ask for forgiveness? So some good points in there. And I just want to end on this note, you know, obviously we all know this is Alex's first time, first time preaching. I think, I think you did a fab- fabulous job, you know, and I think, you know, when you started talking about things that were, were close to you and, and experiences, you sort of loosened up a bit and, 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 and really started to share what was on your heart. That's where I thought you really shined. So I, I think you did a great job. And, I, and, you know, sometimes when a topic is familiar, for those of us who are, are, are more, uh, like, I guess, mature in the faith or maybe more knowledgeable at, about these things, you know, when we see somebody preaching that's new or we see somebody that's preaching on a, on a, on a familiar topic, sometimes we get into the bad habit of just thinking, oh, you know, you know paying attention to the mistakes they make. You know, like, it, you know, like you, maybe, maybe they're stumbling or they lost their place or they're trying to look through their notes and you start to focus on that instead of what God is actually trying to teach you through this person. Um, and also, when a topic is very familiar, sometimes we get into the habit of, oh, I know about this already. And then we tune out, right? Start thinking about the soccer. Start thinking about what I'm going to do after church. You know, this is, this is a wrong way. You know, when you come to church, you have to be ready to hear. Even when, you know, somebody's not as experienced as, as other preachers or not as, not as interesting. Hey, you know, it's up to you to learn what God has for you this morning. Because even though Alex is new, and you know, maybe he's not the, the greatest preacher yet, right? But then you can still come to church this morning, hear what God has prepared on Alex's heart, and you can take something away. I, I'm always reminded of the story where, I, I think it's a proverb, I can't, I can't remember exactly, but you know, Solomon, he comes along 
to the field of the slothful, right? And he sees the, the, the thorns overgrown and the, and, and, the, and the wall broken over. But he says, you know, he looked at that situation and he learned something from it, right? He wasn't just complaining about how you know, lazy this person was and, and just focused on the negative. Like he, he looked at it and he said, hey, a little folding of the arms, a little, um, I can't remember exactly how it says, but a little folding of the arms will sleep. You know, he says, so shall our poverty come as, a, as, a, as, as somebody that wandereth. So in, in every situation, right, you can learn something. Um, and, and I just wanted to mention that because obviously when, you know, we all, we all have done that, right? We all, we all have done that when we see somebody that's it's not as talented as preaching yet or, you know, the message is something that's really familiar to us and we tune out. But I just wanted to encourage you this morning that, you know, when you come to church, be ready to listen, be ready to hear because even in a sermon like that, hey, I learned something from that. That was great. Um, so just, I hope that was a blessing to you as well. And we'll continue to have other guys come. I definitely encourage everybody. You know, I, I, I'm all for giving everyone an opportunity to preach. I don't, I don't think, you know, this is some sacred place that, you know, obviously, I, I, you know, I want people to treat the pulpit with, with, with sobri sobriety and gravity. But hey, you know what? If you want an opportunity to preach, you've got something on your heart. Hey, if you take the time and you, you take the work, to prepare something, hey, I'll give you the opportunity to preach and you can be a blessing and you can help as well to edify this church because I don't want this church just to be about me, right? I think, we can, I, think, I think everybody in this church has something that they can add to this body, whether it's their experience, their testimony, things that God has shown them from the Word. And I want you to have the opportunity to get up here and be a blessing to the, to the hearers on a Sunday morning. So keep that in mind. If you want to serve the Lord, just um, come and talk to me and, and we'll, we'll book you in and and, and, and give you a chance to preach if you, if you are willing to, to put in the work in and, and, and prepare something. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for, uh, you know, willing people to get up here and, and, and preach your word. Lord, it's not always easy. Um, but Lord, I just uh, thank you that we can learn from one another. Pray, Lord, that we'll continue to, to, to strengthen each other. Lord, that we'll come to church with a mind ready to learn um, what you have to say to us uh, each Sunday. And I uh, pray, Lord, that uh, our fellowship will strengthen. Um, thank you, Lord, that we can eat together. And I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to use us. Use the soul winning, Lord. Pray, Lord, as we go out and knock doors today. Uh, Lord, uh, give us, encourage us all to, to go out and get involved. And, um, and Lord, I pray that you continue to use us, uh, keep us safe, <coughs> give us wisdom as we preach your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.